The March Sisters The place was a small town in Massachusetts, North America. It was a cold evening in December 1862. Snow was falling softly. In the living room of a small house, four sisters were sitting by the fire. Their names were Meg, Joe, Beth, and Amy March. Meg was 16 years old. Joe was 15. Beth was 13 years old and Amy was 12. Their mother, Mrs. March, was not in the house. She was visiting a poor, sick family. Their father, Mr. March, was far away from home. It was wartime. Mr. March was working in a hospital for soldiers. The four sisters were knitting with wool. They were knitting socks for the soldiers. They worked and they talked. We are poor, said Meg, the eldest girl. It is terrible. Meg was very pretty. She had large eyes and soft brown hair. Other girls have lots of pretty things, said Amy, the youngest girl. Amy had golden hair and blue eyes. I hate girls' work and girls' things, said Joe. She was tall and thin. She had beautiful, long red hair. I don't want to stay at home, she said. I want to fight in the war. Then Beth spoke. Yes, we are poor, she said, but we are lucky too. We have father and mother and we have each other. Beth was very shy. She was afraid of strangers, but she loved her family very much. Yes, we have each other, said Joe, and the girls were happy again. It's six o'clock, said Meg. Be quick, everybody. Mother is coming. We must get supper ready. Joe brought more wood for the fire. Meg lit the lamps. Beth and Amy put the food on the table. The door opened and Mrs. March came into the room. Mrs. March was not beautiful, but she was very kind and good. Her daughters had a special name for her. They called her Marmy. How are you, my dears? said Mrs. March. Did you have a good day? Yes, thank you, Marmy, replied the four sisters. Come, sit down by the fire, Marmy, said Meg. Supper is ready. After supper, Mrs. March said, Girls, I have a wonderful surprise. Everybody was excited. Is it a letter from father? asked Joe. Yes, replied Mrs. March. Father has a Christmas message for all of you. The girls read their father's letter. Chapter 2 A Wonderful Christmas A few days later, it was Christmas Day. On Christmas morning, the girls woke early. Each girl had one present a book from their mother. They ran downstairs. They wanted to thank her, but Mrs. March was not there. A special Christmas breakfast was on the table. There was lots of food and everybody was hungry, but the girls waited for their mother. They waited nearly an hour. At last, their mother came home. Merry Christmas, Marmy! The girl shouted, Come, sit down. Let's eat breakfast. Merry Christmas, little daughters, said Mrs. March. Listen, I have something to tell you. There is a poor woman, Mrs. Hummel. She lives in the town. She has seven children. One is a baby. The Hummel's house is very cold and they have no food. Will you give them a Christmas present? Will you give them your breakfast? All the girls were very hungry. For a moment, nobody spoke. Then Joe said, Yes, we will, Marmy. Let's take the food to them now. It was early morning and it was cold. The girls walked quickly through the snow. They carried baskets of food and wood for the fire. The Hummel family lived in one small room 
The room was in a house near a river. The windows of the room were broken, and there was no fire. Mrs. Hummel lay in her bed. She was ill. The baby was crying and the children were cold and hungry. The Hummel children saw the March sisters and the baskets of food. They shouted happily. Thank you, thank you, they shouted. The girls made a fire and they put the food on the table. Mrs. March made some tea. Soon the room was warm. The hungry children ate the food and they laughed. Later, Mrs. March and her daughters went home. They had bread and milk for breakfast, but they were very happy. The March sisters often acted in plays. Joe wrote the plays. The girls acted in a small room at the top of the house. They put on brightly colored clothes and they enjoyed themselves. On Christmas evening, the girls acted in a play. All their friends came. Everybody enjoyed the play. Later, their friends went home and the girls had a lovely surprise. Mrs. March called to them. Supper is ready, she said. The girls ran downstairs. They saw lots of delicious food on the table. Cakes, sweets, fruit, and ice cream. Where did this lovely food come from, Marmy? Amy asked. Mrs. March smiled. Old Mr. Lawrence sent it, she replied. Old Mr. Lawrence, our neighbor? asked Meg. She was surprised. But we don't know him, she said. He heard about your breakfast, said Mrs. March. He has sent you a special Christmas supper. The girls looked at each other. This is a wonderful Christmas. Beth said. Chapter 3 Lori. Next to the March's small house, there was a large house. The sisters called this house the Lawrence House. It belonged to their neighbor, Mr. Lawrence. Mr. Lawrence was old, and he was very rich. His house was very beautiful. He lived in the house with his grandson. His grandson was 15, the same age as Joe. Sometimes the March sisters saw Mr. Lawrence's grandson. But the boy was always alone. A few days after Christmas, Joe was in her garden. She was wearing boots and an old coat. Joe was busy. She was sweeping snow from the path with a broom. Joe looked up at the Lawrence house. She saw a face looking out of a window. It was Mr. Lawrence's grandson. The boy is sad. He is lonely, thought Joe. Then she had an idea. She took some snow and she made a ball with it. She threw the ball at the window. The boy laughed and he opened the window. Hello? called Joe. Are you ill? I was ill last week, said the boy. I'm better now, but I'm very bored. I am not doing anything. I'll visit you, said Joe. Yes, please come, said the boy. A few minutes later, Joe knocked on the door of the Lawrence house. She was carrying a small basket. The basket was full of apples and cakes. The boy opened the door and Joe gave him the basket. These things are for you, she said. They are from my mother. Thank you very much, said the boy. Please come in. My name is Lori, and you're Joe, aren't you? Yes, said Joe. She was very surprised. How do you know my name? I know your name, said Lori. I know all your sisters' names. You call to each other in your garden. Sometimes I see you with your mother, Lori said sadly. I have no mother. My parents are dead. So I live here with my grandfather. But my grandfather is not at home today. Lori is rich, but he's very lonely, 
thought Joe. I am poor, but I have a family and I have a happy home. Please visit us, said Joe. We are neighbors. Let's be friends, too. Joe and Lori talked all afternoon. Joe talked about her family. Lori talked about his life. He did not go to school. A teacher, Mr. Brooke, came to the house every day. Mr. Brooke taught Lori his lessons. Come into our library, said Lori. We have many fine books in the library. The library was a beautiful room with big windows. There were hundreds of interesting books on the shelves. There were many fine pictures on the walls. What a wonderful room, said Joe. Suddenly, Lori and Joe heard a noise. Grandfather has come home, said Lori. I must go to him. Please stay here. Lori went out of the library. Joe stood by the fire. There was a picture of old Mr. Lawrence on the wall. Joe looked at the picture. The door of the library opened, but she did not turn round. Lori, she said. Mr. Lawrence, your grandfather is not handsome, but he has a kind face. I like him. Thank you, said a voice. Joe turned round quickly. Mr. Lawrence was standing near the door. Oh, she said. I am sorry. So I'm not handsome, asked Mr. Lawrence. Well, no, sir. But I have a kind face? Yes, you do, sir, replied Joe. Mr. Lawrence laughed. I knew your grandfather, he said. He was a good man. Now have some tea. Lori was very happy. Lori and Joe drank tea and they talked. Mr. Lawrence watched them. My grandson is happy, he thought. He was lonely. He must have some friends. Later, Joe went home. She told her mother and her sisters about the Lawrence's beautiful house. Marmy, please let Lori visit us, she said. Yes, dear, replied Mrs. March. Your new friend Lori will be welcome in our house. Chapter 4 A present for Beth, Lori, and the March sisters became good friends. They visited each other often. They had many happy days together. Everybody liked Lori and his grandfather. Meg, Joe, and Amy all went to the Lawrence house. Meg loved flowers and gardens. She liked the garden at the Lawrence house very much. It was winter and there were no flowers. But there was snow on the trees. They were very beautiful. Joe wrote plays and stories, and she loved books. She liked the library at the Lawrence house. Amy liked the library, too. She painted pictures. She liked the paintings on the library walls. But Beth did not visit the Lawrence house. She was very shy. She was afraid of old Mr. Lawrence. Beth did not go to school. She learned her lessons at home. Beth's life was quiet, but she was very happy. She helped her mother with the housework. She learned her lessons every day. Beth loved music. The Marches had a piano, but it was very old. Beth tried to play the piano, but the music did not sound very good. One day, Mr. Lawrence spoke to Mrs. March. Do your daughters play the piano? He asked. Beth plays the piano, Mrs. March replied. I have a beautiful piano, said Mr. Lawrence. But nobody plays it now. Will Beth come to my house? Will she play the piano? Beth is very shy, Mrs. March said. Lori and I are often out of the house, said Mr. Lawrence. Beth must come then. We will not hear her playing the piano. Mrs. March told Beth the news.
Beth was very happy and excited. She wanted to play Mr. Lawrence's piano. The next day, Beth went to the Lawrence house. The house was very quiet. Good, thought Beth. Everybody is out of the house. The piano was in the living room. Beth walked very quietly into the room. She touched the piano. How beautiful it is, she thought. Some pages of music were lying on top of the piano. Beth looked at the pages. The music was not difficult, so she started to play. Beth played the piano for many hours. She enjoyed herself very much. After that, she went to the Lawrence house every day. Sometimes Mr. Lawrence was in the house. He often listened to the music. But Beth never saw him. A few weeks passed. One day Beth spoke to her mother. Marmy, she said. I want to thank Mr. Lawrence. He has been very kind. I will give him a present. Shall I knit a pair of slippers for him? Yes, Beth, replied Mrs. March. That's a very good idea. Beth bought some wool, and she made a beautiful pair of slippers. She took them to the Lawrence house. Mr. Lawrence was away from home. So Beth wrote a short note. She put the note and the slippers on a table. Then she went home. Oh, thought Beth. Mr. Lawrence did not like the slippers. The next morning, Beth walked by the river. She was sad. Later, she went home. Her sisters were waiting. They were very excited. Beth, Beth, come quickly, they called. You have a present. Come and see. They took Beth into the living room. In the middle of the room was a beautiful little piano. On top of the piano, there was an envelope. Open the envelope, Beth, said Joe. Please open it for me, said Beth. Joe opened the envelope. She pulled out a note. She read it to her mother and sisters. Beth was very excited. Mr. Lawrence has given me this piano, she said. I am very lucky. Beth sat down at the piano and started to play. The piano sounded beautiful, but suddenly she stopped playing. I must thank Mr. Lawrence now, she said. Beth was not shy anymore. She ran quickly to the Lawrence house and went inside. Mr. Lawrence was in the library. Beth ran to him and she kissed him. Then she said, Dear Mr. Lawrence, Thank you so much for my beautiful piano. Beth was not afraid of Mr. Lawrence anymore. Chapter 5 Amy in Trouble It was Saturday afternoon. Meg and Joe were in their bedroom. They were putting on their coats. They were going out. Amy came into the bedroom. Where are you going? She asked. Don't ask questions said Joe. We're going to the theater with Lori, said Meg. We're going to see a play. Oh, said Amy. I want to come with you, please. No, said Joe. You are too young. I'm not too young, she said. I'm 12 years old. Please, please let me come with you. Joe often became angry very quickly. She became very angry with Amy. No, Amy, she said. We will not take you with us. Please go away. Amy started to cry. At that moment, Lori arrived at the house. Meg, Joe, are you ready? He shouted. We're coming, Joe replied. Joe and Meg ran downstairs. Amy stopped crying. You'll be sorry, Joe March, she shouted. Joe and Meg had a wonderful time at the theater. They returned home in the evening. Amy was reading a book.
she did not ask them questions about the play. The next day, Meg, Beth, and Amy were sitting in the living room. They were sitting by the fire. Suddenly, Joe ran into the room. She was very upset. Where is my book of stories? She asked her sisters. Have you seen it? Joe often wrote stories. She wrote them all in a little book. But today, she could not find her book. I haven't seen your book, said Meg. Have you seen it, Beth? No, said Beth. Amy was very quiet. She did not say anything. Amy, where is my book of stories? asked Joe. I don't know, replied Amy. Yes, you do know, said Joe. Tell me immediately, where is it? You'll never see it again, said Amy. Why not? asked Joe. I burnt it, said Amy. You didn't let me come to the theater yesterday, so I threw your book of stories on the fire. Joe was very angry. She held Amy's arms and shouted at her. You bad, bad girl, Joe shouted. I wrote those stories for father. Now they are gone forever. Suddenly, Amy was sorry. She started to cry. Please forgive me, Joe, Amy said. I'm very, very sorry. Tears fell from her eyes. I'll never forgive you, said Joe. Never. Joe did not speak to Amy again that day. She was very angry and upset. The next day, the weather was very cold. There was a river near the March's house. The river had frozen. It was ice. Lori came to the March's house. He was carrying a pair of ice skates. Let's go to the river, Joe, he said. We'll skate on the ice. All right, replied Joe. She went to a cupboard and she took out her ice skates. Amy watched her sister. After a few minutes, Joe and Lori left the house. I want to skate too, Amy said to Meg. Take your ice skates and run after Joe, said Meg. Joe will enjoy herself. She will soon be happy. Ask her to be your friend again. That is a good idea, said Amy. She ran after Joe and Lori. The river was not far away. Soon she saw Joe and Lori skating on the ice. The ice was very thin in the middle of the river. Joe heard Lori's words. But Amy did not hear Lori. She skated to the middle of the river. Suddenly, there was a loud crack. The ice broke. Amy was in the water. Joe was terribly afraid. But she followed Lori. They pulled Amy from the river. Amy was not hurt, but she was very cold and frightened. Joe and Lori took Amy home. Mrs. March carried Amy upstairs to her bedroom. She took off the little girl's wet clothes, and she wrapped her in a blanket. Then she carried her downstairs to the living room. Amy fell asleep by the warm fire. Will Amy be all right, Marmy? asked Joe. Yes, dear, replied her mother. Amy was in trouble, but she will be all right now. She isn't hurt. Joe started to cry. I was angry with Amy, said Joe. She burnt my book of stories, but now I am very sorry. Sometimes I become angry too quickly. What shall I do, Marmy? Please help me. Don't cry, Joe, said Mrs. March. Remember this day. You won't become angry again. I will remember, said Joe. At that moment, Amy opened her eyes and she smiled. She held out her arms towards Joe. The two sisters did not speak, but they kissed and they put their arms round each other. They were friends again. Winter soon passed, spring came, and then summer. Mrs. March and her daughters were happy.
but they all wanted to see Mr. March again soon. Chapter 6 Meg Loses a Glove Meg, the eldest March sister, was a very pretty girl. Her friends often invited her to parties. Meg enjoyed the parties, but sometimes she was sad. She was sad because her family was poor. Meg's friends lived in fine houses. They had beautiful clothes. But Meg did not have beautiful clothes and lovely things. One day in July, Meg was at a friend's house. She heard a conversation. Two women were talking, her friend's mother and another woman. They were talking about Meg. Meg March is a kind and lovely girl, said one woman. But her family is poor. The Marches live near the Lawrences, said the other woman. The Lawrences are very rich. Does Mrs. March have marriage plans for her daughters? Will one of them marry Mr. Lawrence's grandson? Meg heard these words and she was very upset. I like Lori very much, she thought. But I do not want to marry him. We don't think about Lori's money. He is our best friend. Meg went home. She spoke to her mother. Marmy, do you have marriage plans for us? She asked. Marriage plans, said Mrs. March. Meg told her mother all about the women's conversation. Mrs. March was very angry. Those women are very foolish, she said. My daughters are beautiful and good and happy. They will marry good husbands. But good men are not always rich men, Mrs. March said. Love is more important than money. Don't marry a rich man without love, Meg. Marry a poor man with love. Then you will be happy. You're right, Marmy, Meg said. I'll always remember your words. The next day, a letter arrived for Joe. Joe read the letter to her sisters. A picnic! That will be exciting, said Amy. Please, Marmy, we want to go on the picnic. Very well. Go on the picnic, said Mrs. March. You will have a good time. The next day was warm and sunny. Lori and his new friends walked to the river. The March girls met them there. They all brought baskets of food. They put the baskets into the two small boats. The March sisters sat in the boats. Lori and his friends rowed the boats on the river. Then they got out and they found a good place for the picnic. Everybody was hungry and the food was delicious. Later, Joe, Lori, Beth, and Amy talked to Lori's friends and they played games. Meg was reading a German book. She did not understand some of the words. Mr. Brook, Lori's teacher, was a quiet young man. He had brown eyes and a kind face. He often looked at Meg. But Meg did not see him looking at her. You're a very good teacher, Mr. Brook, said Meg. Thank you, replied Mr. Brook. I enjoy my work. Lori is a very good student. Everybody had a good time at the picnic. At last, they had to go home. The next day, Meg was looking for her gloves. I've lost a glove, she said. Have you seen it, Joe? No, I haven't seen it, replied Joe. Did you lose it at the picnic? I'll ask Lori. Later, Joe said to Lori, Meg has lost a glove. Lori started to laugh. I know where her glove is, he said. Where is it? asked Joe. I will tell you, said Lori. But don't tell Meg. I won't tell Meg, said Joe. The glove is in John Brooks' pocket, said Lori. Joe did not understand. What do you mean? she said. Why is the glove in John Brooks' pocket?
Meg dropped her glove and John Brooke found it, said Lori. He put the glove in his pocket. He looks at it every day. John is in love with Meg. Isn't that wonderful? But Joe was angry and upset. No, she said. It isn't wonderful. It's terrible news. Mr. Brooke will marry Meg. He will take her away from us. No, I am not happy. I am very unhappy. Chapter 7 A Telegram Summer and autumn passed. It was November. The weather was cold and wet. One afternoon, the March sisters were sitting in their living room. Meg looked out of the window. She watched the rain. November is a terrible month, she said. It is cold and wet. Nothing ever happens. Our lives are very boring, and we have no money. Amy was painting a picture. One day I'll be a famous artist, she said. I'll travel to Italy. I'll paint beautiful pictures. Then I'll sell the pictures. And we will have lots of money. I'm going to write books, said Joe. I'll be rich and famous, too. That is my dream. What is your dream, Beth? I'm very happy now, said Beth. I shall stay at home with Marmy and Father. Meg looked out of the window again. Suddenly, she said, There's Lori. He's coming to the front door. A few moments later, Lori came into the room. He was holding a small envelope in his hand. He was worried and upset. What is it, Lori? said Joe. Is something wrong? Where is Mrs. March? said Lori. I have come from the post office. Lori held up the envelope. This is a telegram for your mother. It's from Washington, he said. At that moment, Mrs. March came into the room. Lori gave her the telegram. Mrs. March opened it and she read it quickly. Then she sat down in a chair. Her face was white. I must go to Washington, said Mrs. March. I will go on the train tomorrow morning. Joe, run to the post office. Send a telegram to the hospital. Send this reply. I will come immediately. Meg, Beth, Amy, come and help me. I have to pack my case. The three girls started to help their mother. Joe put on her hat and she went out. Lori went home. Mrs. March went to her desk in the living room. She opened a drawer. There was some money in the drawer. She looked at the money. There was not very much. I have to buy a train ticket, she thought. Will the girls have enough money for food? A few minutes later, there was a knock on the front door. Meg opened the door. Old Mr. Lawrence and Mr. Brooke, Lori's teacher, were standing outside. Lori told us the bad news about your father, said Mr. Lawrence. I'm very sorry. Will your mother go to Washington? Yes, said Meg. She will go to Washington tomorrow morning. She must not go alone, said Mr. Lawrence. A friend must go with her. I'm an old man. I am not strong. I can't go with her. But John Brooke is a young man. He can go to Washington with your mother. Mr. Brooke looked at Meg, and he smiled. His face was very kind. Don't worry about your mother, he said. I'll take care of her. Meg was very pleased. Thank you very, very much, she said. Soon everything was ready for Mrs. March's journey. Evening came, but Joe had not returned. Mrs. March was worried. Where is Joe? She said. It's very late. At last, Joe came home. She walked into the kitchen, and she put some money on the table. This money is for your journey, Marmy, she said. Mrs. March looked at the money.
Then she looked at Joe. She was very surprised. Twenty-five dollars, she said. Joe, where did you get this money? Joe did not answer. She took off her hat. Everybody looked at her. Joe's hair was very short. Your hair, your beautiful red hair, said Meg. Oh, Joe, what have you done? Many women want long red hair, said Joe. I went to the barber's shop. The barber cut my hair. Then I sold him my hair. He gave me twenty-five dollars for it. I wanted to help Marmy and Father. Tears fell from Mrs. March's eyes. Joe, you are good and kind, she said. That night, Meg and Joe could not sleep. Joe was thinking about her hair. Meg was thinking about Mr. Brooke. Both girls were worrying about their father. The next morning, Mr. Lawrence's carriage came to the Marches' house. Mr. Brooke was sitting inside the carriage. Mrs. March kissed her daughters and she said goodbye. Then she got into the carriage. The sun shone on the sad faces of the March sisters. Goodbye, dear Marmy, they said. Goodbye. Chapter 8 Beth is ill. Mrs. March was in Washington. The four sisters worked very hard. They did the housework every day. They were worried about their father and mother. But the girls were very kind to each other. And they wrote to their mother every day. Soon, a letter arrived from Mrs. March. The girls were happy. And soon, Meg, Joe, and Amy forgot about the housework. Beth did not forget. She did her own work, and she did her sister's work, too. One afternoon, Beth, Meg, and Joe were talking. Amy was not at home. Meg, said Beth. Please, will you visit the Hummel family? Marmy often visits them. Marmy is not here. We must visit the Hummels. I'm sorry, Beth. I'm very tired today, said Meg. Joe must go to the Hummels' house. I can't go, said Joe. I'm going to meet Lori. I can't visit the Hummels today. You must go yourself, Beth. I've visited the Hummels every day this week, said Beth. The baby is ill and I am very worried. Oh, said Meg. Amy will come home soon. Then she must visit the Hummels. An hour passed, but Amy did not come home. Meg and Joe went upstairs. Meg looked at a new dress. Joe wrote a story. They forgot about the Hummels. Beth waited. At last, she put on her coat. She put some food in a basket, and she went out. Meg and Joe did not see her leaving. Later, Beth returned. She did not speak to anybody. She went upstairs to her mother's bedroom, and she shut the door. An hour later, Joe found Beth. Beth was sitting on her mother's bed. Her face was white and she was crying. She was holding a bottle of medicine. What is wrong? Joe asked. Oh, Joe, the baby is dead, said Beth. Which baby? asked Joe. The Hummel baby, replied Beth. I went to the Hummel's house this afternoon. The baby was very ill. Mrs. Hummel went to get the doctor. I held the baby in my arms, but it died. Oh, Beth, that is terrible, said Joe. What happened next? Mrs. Hummel came back with the doctor, said Beth. The doctor looked at the baby. He said, this baby had scarlet fever. Scarlet fever, said Joe. Yes, Beth said. The doctor gave me this medicine. He said, go home immediately, drink some of this, and now I have a headache and I'm very hot.
Suddenly, Joe was afraid. Has Beth got scarlet fever? She thought. It is a very dangerous illness. Don't worry, Beth, Joe said. I'll tell Meg. We will get Marmy's doctor. Meg was very worried. Beth went to the Hummel's house every day, she said to Joe. We must get Dr. Bangs immediately. Dr. Bangs came and he looked at Beth. Then the doctor spoke to Meg and Joe. Beth has scarlet fever, he said. Who will take care of her? We will, said Meg. Joe and I have had scarlet fever. We are safe. Has Amy had scarlet fever? asked Dr. Bangs. Amy hasn't had the fever, replied Meg. She will not be safe here. She must stay with father's aunt, Aunt March. Good, said Dr. Bangs. Take care of Beth. I'll come again tomorrow. The doctor left the house. Joe spoke to Meg. We must write to Marmy, she said. We must tell her about Beth. No, said Meg. Marmy is taking care of father. She can't come home now. Marmy must stay in Washington. We must not tell her about Beth. Joe started to cry. Washington is many miles away, she said. We were wrong, Meg. We didn't visit the Hummels. Beth went there every day. And now she has scarlet fever. Oh, Meg, what are we going to do? Meg put her arms round Joe. Don't cry, Joe, she said. Beth has scarlet fever, but she will get better soon. Now we must take care of her. The next day, Amy went to Aunt March's house. Meg and Joe took care of Beth. Chapter 9 News from Washington, Beth was very ill. The days passed and she did not get better. Beth could not eat. She slept for many hours. Sometimes she was awake, but she could not remember things. Sometimes she called Joe, Meg. Sometimes she called Meg, Joe. Beth said her mother's name again and again. Joe and Meg were worried and afraid. One morning, the two girls were talking. Let's send a telegram to Marmy, said Joe. Let's tell her about Beth now. Then she will come home. All right, said Meg. She sat down and she wrote the words for a telegram. I'll take this to the post office this afternoon, said Meg. But that afternoon, a letter arrived from Mrs. March. There was bad news in the letter. Mr. March was very ill again. Meg and Joe read the letter. They looked at each other. We must not send the telegram to Marmy, said Meg. Beth is ill, but father is ill too. Marmy must stay with him. She can't come home now. A week later, it was the first day of December. The weather was very cold. The wind blew all day and snow fell. In the morning, Dr. Bangs visited the house. He looked at Beth for a long time. Then he spoke to Meg and Joe. Beth is very, very ill, he said. Your mother must to come home immediately. I will come back tonight. Meg, said Joe. We must send the telegram to Marmy. Joe put on her coat and hat, and she ran outside. Lori was walking towards the house. He was holding a letter in his hand. He was very happy and excited. I have good news, he said. This letter is from John Brooke. Your father is getting better now. But what's wrong, Joe? Where are you going? I'm going to send a telegram to Marmy, replied Joe. Dr. Bangs visited Beth. She is very, very ill. Joe started to cry. Lori held Joe's hand. Dear Joe, he said, 
Grandfather and I will always help you. Please remember that. Yes, said Joe. You are our good friends. Thank you very much. I must tell you something, said Lori. Last week, Grandfather and I were talking about Beth. We were very worried about her. We sent a telegram to your mother. We told her about Beth's illness. Today, I received this letter from John Brooke. Your mother will be here early tomorrow morning. Then everything will be all right. Joe was happy again. She stopped crying. Lori, she said, you're a wonderful friend. Thank you. Joe ran inside the house. She told Meg the good news. Meg was very happy, too. The afternoon passed slowly. Beth lay in her bed. Her eyes were closed. She did not eat or speak. Sometimes she drank some water. Meg and Joe sat by her bed. The wind blew and the snow fell. At last, night came. Meg and Joe watched Beth. They waited for Mrs. March, and they waited for Dr. Bangs. Old Mr. Lawrence and Lori waited, too. They sat downstairs in the living room. They sat by the fire. The hours passed. At two o'clock in the morning, Joe went to the window. She looked out at the garden. There was thick snow everywhere. The world is sad and lonely tonight she thought. Suddenly, she heard a noise. She turned round. Meg was crying. Beth has died, thought Joe. Beth has died and Meg cannot tell me. She went to the bed and looked down at Beth. Beth was quiet. Her eyes were closed. Then the door opened and Dr. Bangs came into the room. Beth is dead, Joe said quietly. Dr. Bangs looked at Beth. He held her hands. Then he smiled. No, he said. Beth isn't dead. She's sleeping. She's going to be all right. There is no more danger. Meg and Joe put their arms round each other, and they cried. They were very, very happy. Soon it was morning. The sisters heard the sound of a carriage in the street. Then Lori called from the living room. Girls! Girls! Your mother is here! Mrs. March had come home. Chapter 10 The best Christmas present, Amy was unhappy at Aunt March's house. She wanted to see her family. Aunt March was an old lady. She did not like young girls. Sometimes she was angry with Amy. Every evening, Amy had to read to Aunt March, but she did not like Aunt March's books. They were not very interesting. One evening, Aunt March spoke to Amy. I have had a letter from your mother, she said. She has come home. She will take you home tomorrow. Amy was very happy. Soon the four sisters were together again, and every day Beth was stronger. One day, a letter came from Washington. It was from John Brooke. Mrs. March read the letter. Girls, girls, I have wonderful news, she said. Mr. Brooke is going to bring father home. It was a week before Christmas. The March sisters were very busy and excited. They made Christmas presents, and they cooked delicious food for Christmas Day. In the evening, Jo spoke to her mother. Marmy, she said, I must tell you something. John Brooke loves Meg. In the summer, Meg lost a glove. John Brooke found it, and he put it in his pocket. Isn't that terrible, Marmy? Why is it terrible? asked Mrs. March. John Brooke will marry Meg, replied Joe. 
he'll take her away from us. Listen, Joe, said Mrs. March. John Brooke is a good young man. He was very kind and helpful in Washington. John Brooke must not marry Meg, Joe said. Meg must not marry a poor man. Money is not important, replied Mrs. March. John is good and kind. He loves Meg very much, but Meg is young. She is only seventeen. They must wait. Please don't be sad, Joe, Mrs. March said. One day you will leave this house too. You will meet a good man and you will marry him. No, mother, cried Joe. I'll never marry anybody. I want to be a famous writer. At last it was Christmas Day. Everybody had some presents. Everybody was happy. In the afternoon, Lori and old Mr. Lawrence came to the Marches' house. They brought presents. Everybody talked and everybody laughed. Then somebody knocked at the front door. Lori went to the door. A moment later, he came back into the living room. He was very excited. Here is another Christmas present for the March family, he said. A tall man was standing behind Lori. Everybody looked at the man. For a moment, they did not speak. Then the girls shouted together, Father! All the sisters ran to their father. They put their arms round him. Everybody was talking and crying. This is the best Christmas present, said Amy. Then another man came into the room. It was John Brooke. Meg ran to towards him. I'm very happy to see you, John, she said. Thank you. You have brought father home to us. Later, everybody ate Christmas dinner. Then the Lawrences and John Brooke went home. The March family sat by the fire. Mr. March looked at the faces of his four happy daughters. My dears, he said, this year has been very long and difficult. You had to work very hard. I left home and you were girls. Now you have grown up. You are four fine women. Chapter 11 A Happy Ending The Marches Were Together Again Every day Mr. March and Beth were stronger. Lori and old Mr. Lawrence often visited the Marches, but John Brooke did not come with them. Meg was sad. She wanted to see John very much. I don't understand, she thought. Why doesn't John visit us? One afternoon, Meg and Joe were talking. Joe saw an umbrella by the front door. Whose umbrella is that? she asked. I've never seen it before. It's John Brooks' umbrella, replied Meg. He left it here on Christmas Day. He has forgotten it. Meg, said Joe. Do you like John Brooke? Do you love him? Are you going to marry him? No, no, Meg said. I'm too young for marriage. Please don't ask me these questions, Joe. Then you don't love him, said Joe. Oh, I don't know, said Meg. Joe looked out of the window. Meg, John Brooke is outside now, she said. He is coming to the front door. You don't love him, Meg. He must go away. Please tell him. Meg ran to the stairs. She wanted to hide in her bedroom, but it was too late. John Brooke came into the house. Good afternoon, John said. Do you have my umbrella? I left it here. He smiled. Then he said, How is your father? He's very well, thank you, said Joe. We'll bring him. Joe went upstairs and Meg started to follow, but John Brooke stopped her. Please don't go, Meg, he said. I must say something to you. Oh, said Meg. Let's talk in the living room. John and Meg went into the living room.
Meg sat down and John Brooks sat beside her. He held her hand. Dearest Meg, he said, I love you. I am poor, but I can work hard. I can make a good home for you. Please, Meg, will you be my wife? At first, Meg did not speak. Then she said, I don't know, John. Please, Meg, said John Brooke. Will you marry me? Suddenly, the door opened and Aunt March came into the room. Meg and John were very surprised. Aunt March was surprised, too. Good afternoon, Meg, she said. Where is your father? Then she looked at John Brooke. Who is this young man? Aunt March, this is John Brooke, Meg said. John is father's friend. John Brooke, said Aunt March. Why are you here, young man? What are you talking about? Aunt March, said Meg quietly. John Brooke wants to marry me. Aunt March looked angrily at John Brooke. Then she said, Young man, Mrs. March has spoken about you. You are poor. You have no money. Meg must marry a man with money. Meg was very angry. Aunt March, she said. John is poor, but he is a good man and I love him. John Brooke smiled and his eyes were bright. Dearest Meg, he said, do you love me? Will you marry me? Yes, I will, said Meg. Meg, said Aunt March, you are a very foolish girl. You will never get any money from me. Goodbye. She turned round and went quickly out of the room. Meg and John told the March family their good news. It's wonderful news, said Mr. and Mrs. March. Congratulations. Congratulations, said Amy and Beth together. Joe said nothing. She was not happy. Later. Lori and Mr. Lawrence came to the house. They congratulated Meg and John, but Lori looked at Joe's face. What's wrong, Joe? asked Lori. Aren't you happy? No, said Joe. Meg is my dear sister and my dear friend. Now John Brooke will take her away. Joe, said Lori, you love Meg. She is your sister. But John loves her, too. Meg will be happy with John. And Joe, I'll always be your friend. That's true, said Joe. Thank you, Lori. Joe looked round the room. She looked at her family. Mr. and Mrs. March were talking together. Amy was sitting on the floor near Meg and John. Beth was talking to old Mr. Lawrence. Suddenly, Joe was not sad anymore. She turned to Lori. You are right, Lori, she said. One day Meg will marry John, but she will always be my sister. We will always love each other. That's right, Joe, said Lori. Joe went over to Meg. She held Meg's hands and she kissed her face. Congratulations, dearest Meg, she said. I am very happy for you. And congratulations, John. You are our brother now. Welcome to our family.